The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're coming to you live from many locations uh, around the state of California this morning. Uh, thrilled to be here with you this morning. We are going to be live with you for the next hour. And uh, Evelyn Kong, you can see her on the screen. She is here next to me because she's going to be joining us for Ask Evelyn Kong. I want to make sure that you guys know that the hour is meant to be interactive. We want to hear from you. We want to know your thoughts, your feelings, your questions, and your concerns. There's a myriad of ways that you can write into us uh, and be a part of the show. Uh, if you want to, you can go to autism-live.com. There is a live feature at the bottom. I will tell you that if you're watching the show live, you're probably watching us on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Periscope. The two most convenient ways to write in right now uh, with current setup are on Facebook and on YouTube. We encourage you to write your questions in early, starting right now. Uh, we do have some questions that we got throughout uh, last night and a couple of days ago, uh, but we are taking questions live. And I know sometimes you guys get frustrated and you're like, how come she's not taking my question? There's like this tipping point where people start about 20 minutes into the hour, everybody starts to write in and then we don't get through all of them. So I really encourage you to write in early and often. Persistence also wins the day. Uh, I want to remind you that we, we do podcast to many different sites and more coming that we are now on. Not only will we podcast to YouTube and you can watch us still recorded on Facebook and uh, Twitter and Periscope, but we're also a free download on iTunes and it, you can choose. You can just download the audio or you can do the audio and the video portion. We're also on Deezer, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and a few more. <laughs> We just started doing, I can't remember what their names are. Uh, Ghana, we're on Ghana. And there's another one too, I don't know. Uh, but more coming, so we're very excited about that. I Before we get to um, Evelyn Kong, I gotta take just a couple of minutes because in the last couple of days, so many people have emailed me and uh, about a story that has been unfolding in the news. Of course, I'm talking about the young man who was shot several times uh, in the state of Utah. If you watch the show, you know that I don't like to use names. Um, in this case, I don't want to use the name because it's a 13 year old. And even though his name is out there in the press, I think that we need to preserve some anonymity for him and his family. Uh, but in general, I don't like to use names here because I do think that there is a whole segment of the world that functions on attention and then says, oh, well, you know, if bad things happen, then people talk about me and I don't want to, I don't want to in any way further that. I want to start by saying, first of all, that um, I feel so badly for this family and for this mom, because if you know the story, you know that she called the police and asked for a crisis unit to come to her house because her 13-year-old son was having a meltdown. She reports that it's because she went to work for the first time in a year and he was having extreme separation anxiety. She needed support. She needed help. She was asking for them to take her child, um, I guess, into custody for a mental health situation. And that instead what happened was that they came and within five minutes, shots were fired. And um, this young man is in the hospital and recovering from multiple gunshot wounds. And it really, it's not the first time that we've heard this. Um, and it's not the first state where we've seen this happening. And, and it made me think back to earlier this summer when we did a, a show and talked about Black Lives Matter. And somebody wrote to me afterwards so angry and said, why are you talking about this? Why don't you stick to autism? 
and I, you know, came back on the show. I talked, had a great conversation with this person, by the way. And we saw that once we talked, we were more on the same page than previously they thought we were. Um, but I remember saying, if you think that these kinds of things, um, excessive force are not happening within the disability community and the autism community, I think you need to think again. Now, I do feel the need to say um, that on Friday, we are doing a show in which we're honoring people who are first responders who have kiddos that are on the autism spectrum. And I, and I, I still fully plan to do that. And I think that that's an important thing to do. I don't think that the police entered that home with the idea that this is how it was going to happen. Um, I'm a former teacher, so I'm about training. And I understand that the police department is reporting that they have done mental health um, training with the police. But I said to somebody last night, when you send a hammer to do the work of a spatula, you cannot be surprised when the outcome is not what you'd hoped. And as much as we can say that we, you know, in some cases we're giving some training to the police, I don't think it's the right training. And it's a very scary proposition, but when we say that more than 2% of the population is now on the autism spectrum, if we are not fully educating our police to respond in a different way, and I think this does, you know, it's a different situation, but it goes hand in hand with Black Lives Matter. Until we have a police department that functions in situations where they are appropriate and have appropriate training for that. And we have other people who are trained to respond in other ways to other things, we are going to continue to have problems. So it's training and, and sending the right people to do the right things. Uh, this is my opinion. I'm poor Evelyn, I'm, you know, she's forced to sit here and listen to this, but, but I, I just, I wanna be clear for us I just felt so powerless the last couple of days. Like we do all these things and the work is not done and you feel powerless. And if this can happen to this 13 year old, you know, the truth is that it could happen to anyone. And when, if it could happen to this mom, it could happen to anyone. You know, we, we reach out and we ask for help and, and then help arrives and it's not helpful. You know what I'm saying? Um, it is important that we do perspective taking. For any of us that are parents who have had our children have a meltdown, if you can honestly sit there and say that you weren't afraid, I say congratulations to you because I know tons of parents who are afraid when their child has a meltdown. They're afraid for their child's safety. In some cases, they are afraid for their safety. This is a very real thing and we can't sweep it under the carpet and we can't just rely on um, police to school themselves and to know what to do. I think as an autism community, we have to start at home. We have to school all of ourselves in how do we deal with a meltdown? How do we handle it? Uh, how do we deescalate? How do we recognize that it's coming? How do we know what to do to help our kids in those circumstances? And then when once we have that, we all, those of us who have that, need to work to train police and to train politicians to understand that the police are not gonna be the right people to respond to this circumstance. And even though they are not the right people, they have to be trained because sometimes they're going to find themselves there anyway. And that what we are seeing, and this is the parallel that I see behind Black Lives Matter is that we are sending people into a situation and they are bringing their preconceived notions of the world and their prejudices. And they are looking at a situation and they are basing their reactions, which are gonna be fear-based when it is a, you know, a situation where they don't feel in control and then they are reacting on their prejudices. And if we don't solve that, you know, it's, it's the phrase that everybody is saying, until, we, until uh, each and every one of us is safe, none of us is safe. I, I, my heart bleeds in 68 different uh, directions. I have friends and family that are first responders and who are talking about how fearful they are always on any given day in their jobs, but now it is escalated. Um, and, and I feel horrible about that, but where does it stop? And for me, it, it, it starts with the education piece. And we can say they need to learn that, they need to learn that. 
but here at Autism Live, I'm gonna take the tack with all of us that we need to learn what to do. And I, I, I do not think that this mom responded in any way that was inappropriate. She did what she had to do and she gave information to the police and said, this is how you should handle this. And that did not happen. Um, so I don't know, that's what I have to say. Um, we're gonna continue on the show to talk about how do we help our children? How do we teach our children how to react to the police? We'll continue to advocate for reform so that there are more social workers. We'll continue to advocate for police getting training that really works. Years ago, I, when I was a college professor teaching a communications class, one of the gentlemen who was in my class was a night class and he was the chief of the fire department, the local fire department. And one day I remember, I will never forget, he was telling me about an exercise they had just done with his new recruits. And he said, Shannon, I can train these young people and I can train them and I can teach them everything there is to fire, but when they're in a fire, it's an entirely different situation. And so he does an exercise every year where they find an old building and they burn it down and they send the young recruits in to see what it is like um, to be in there. Cause he says, everybody, you know, when, when you get the smell and that it's, you can't see anything in a fire. And he said, nobody can prepare you for that until you're there. And I do think that as an autism community, we need to be more open. Uh, it's hard because we don't want to be telling on our kids, but we need to be showing police what a tantrum meltdown looks like. Um, we need to be really transparent with them and go, this is what this looks like. And, and my child can be this much better 10 minutes later. They are not like this all the time. It's hard. It's really, really hard because we, none of us wants the world to see what our children are like when they are not themselves and not at their best, right? Um, but we, we, we got to do something different. All right, I'm done. Off the soapbox. Uh, Evelyn Kung is here and she is the the amazing person at CARD that we all run to for clinical advice. Evelyn, talk to us for just a second here about what you do at CARD. Uh, and thank you for being here. And sorry that I, you had to sit there through all of that. No, thank you for addressing these issues because I've been in the field for 30 years now and I've seen a lot of mess. I've seen a lot of good things with the police, but I've seen messes too. And, you know, when I saw this uh, article on this child, I just thought, oh, you know, the tense, the tense and the stress on both sides, you know, for the first responders and for the families experiencing, you know, the safety, you know, worries. It's, it's always been there, but I think right now it's even worse. You know, it's intensified on both ends. People worry about the safety on both ends. So it's very legitimate, everything that you're talking about. I mean, I have stories and stories, unfortunately, on the good and the bad of these experiences. And um, so I am, <laughs> I, I'm at CARD. I've been here for almost 30 years when I came into the field. Um, every time I said autism, people would, had no, they'd be like, oh, autistic. So you draw well, you teach people how to <laughs> that was always the response the first five years in this field. And then now it's changed because, you know, one in 58, I think that's the number, right? Um, every person, every age knows somebody on the spectrum. Does not matter. I used to go into classrooms and nobody knew anybody on the spectrum except for maybe the kid, you know, I was working with there. But now every child raises their hand if they know anybody and it's not including the child in their classroom. It's my neighbor, my cousin, my aunt, my uncle, you know, just everybody knows someone now. And um, little five-year-olds can give you all the theories about autism too. And I just look at them and think, you should not know this. You are five. You need to be playing. You should not be worrying about why somebody, you know, why this is yeah. here. Um, but so in many ways, it's been, um, I've been there with the growth or in the population of people with ASD. And I've seen, you know, the, all the different, you know, treatments come in and out. But I always say that it's been, I've been very blessed because I've had some really, really great treat, um, great patients that I've worked with and I've seen some really great outcomes. I've seen a lot. <laughs> and, and that's why Shannon says like when people don't know, they will come my way, but it's a lot of it has to do with just like 30 years ago, nobody knew anything about people on the spectrum. So it was figure it out, 
you know, sit there and problem solve. And to this day, I still say that my favorite thing about this job is working with the families and helping them problem solve where they're at. That is still my favorite thing. Well, and it's such a delight for all of us. It's such a treat for us because you do kind of weave yourself in and out um, and, and visit cases and bring your expertise for so many families. And, you know, you're very modest because you have had tremendous outcomes on so many cases. And I, over the years, you know, one of the things that amazed me when I first got to know you was all the teenagers that at that time, you know, and that was 10 years ago, you had all these teenagers who had graduated from their card program. And then you would, I would meet with you and, and I had a kiddo who was not a teenager yet, but you would, you know, you were trying to quiet my fears and you were like, oh, you know, so somebody called me the other day, you have all these ex clients who would call you and just ask you a question about something. And even then I was telling you, you need to, you know, I, what I envisioned was not even a book, but I wanted a little slide thing that had a little window that it's like, you know, it, this one says, if someone does this, this is the social response for that. <laughs> That's what I pictured. But I, like, so that was 10 years ago. And now these people are like older and married and like you have the best stories of how life goes on and, and, and how little kids grow into teenagers and grow into adults. And when they have the right supports, find all different paths in their lives. So, you know, I just have appreciated that over the last 10 years of not just, you know, and you've been somebody who's been instrumental for my son and helping me to figure out where to go, you know, as we moved into the teenage, teenage years. And I so appreciated that. But I think just hearing all your stories, it just... It's such a gift. You're such a gift to all of us. And, and but I yeah, I, I love, I've actually spent this quarantine, you know, people are reaching out more mm -hmm. from families that I haven't seen in 25 or more years. Like, and I always laugh because I think, wow, I was so young and I was your supervisor and you had five kids and I was telling you what to do. Like, how could that be? <laughs> <laughs> and you hadn't even had kids at that point. <laughs> yep. So I was just, I was like, oh, I just remember like, I shouldn't have said that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had a, I've had a couple of therapists come back to me now and say, I just want to say, I remember a day when I said to you something and now I'm a parent and I want to take it back. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> And I'm like, that's interesting because I just thought, look at them. They're so much younger than me and they know so much more. Um, but it is, it's that perspective taking piece of, of when you tell somebody to do something that you have no idea how hard it is uh, until you're a parent on your own. Uh, it's not that they were wrong, but they were, but they were saying that it was just hard. And, and the fact that I wasn't able to do it the first time was not surprising. Shall well, we I, I think I could have said it in a much better way. <laughs> there you go. I always think I didn't need to tell you. That <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, my goodness. And we should say we want really want to thank you for being with us here today. Do you want us to do a birthday shout out to someone you love? Happy or no? You don't have to. My daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll just turn 21 today. That's amazing. Happy birthday. <laughs> Uh, that's crazy. 21. I can't even believe that. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad that you could be with us today, but I'm sorry that you're not able, able to be there with her. But uh, I'm going to jump into some questions here. And as I said, you guys can be writing in. I see that you already are. Uh, I'm going to actually go to a live question. Why can my son tell me his need, uh, can tell me his wants needs, but he can't have conversations. I ask him questions. He doesn't respond. Oh, that's, there's a big, there's a big divide, or maybe it's a, there's a field between being able to request what you want and being able to respond to questions. It can be anything from as simple as just understanding what all the words mean, you know, definitions of all those words. Um, but the beginning of communication is asking for wants and needs, because things are concrete and real to him. He knows exactly what those words are. He knows that if he says, can I have, or I want with whatever the object or, you know, item is, um, it gets delivered, you know, in some format. So it's a very concrete thing. When you move from just basic 
um, requests or asking to conversations, conversations are very theoretical. It's abstract because you're talking about concepts and things like in the future and the past, or, you know, there's all these descriptive words that belong to it. And um, if your child has any type of language delay and doesn't know all those words means, then it just is nonsense. You know, they don't know what time is. And if you, if you just think about development, a lot of typical kids do not know what time is <laughs> till they're in their school-aged years. And, and in that time, they've had so much language from, you know, birth to seven or six or five or whatever it is. So it's a big jump. So what I encourage families to do is it's great that they start learning what they're asking for because it meets those basic needs. But you're going to gradually increase um, the, the words that they're learning. You're going to gradually increase the concepts that they're learning so they understand it in a very simple way. Like when my kids were younger, I used to always say, if, if their father went on a work trip, I would say, there's 20 times you have to go to sleep <laughs> and wake up. And when they were really little, I would have to include sleep and wake up as their naps had to be included. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but as a way yeah. to mark time, you're going to go to sleep 20 times before you see me again. Yeah. And yeah. I would have to do it in a very concrete way. And that's this. And the only reason I knew to do that is because I worked with kids on the spectrum. You know, I wouldn't know that if I wasn't doing it. I had to make it whatever concrete in a way for them for whatever developmental stage they were at. And that's the same thing that I would encourage you is, you know, ask talking and having the, those conversations. There's a lot of words in there. And just that alone will prevent them from being able to respond. And then also they don't have that social understanding of when I talk to you, you get really happy. You know, that enjoyment, social enjoyment may not be there yet because for them, speaking might be very effortful. Yeah. A lot of effort put into being able to talk. So until language actually becomes more fluent, it's not fun to talk. It's a lot of work. And can I say too, I see this trend right now that a lot of people, um, they get speech, their kids aren't speaking and they get speech services. And they'll say, they'll ask a question about something that's behavioral and they'll go, oh, I wanna know about that from an ABA perspective, uh, but we haven't done ABA because we really wanna work on speech. So we're getting speech therapy, which is upside down. And, and I, I just wanna to say to people that when my son was going through ABA treatment because you know he had autism and part of that was that he wasn't speaking, I got to watch and I always talk about how weird ABA looked to be. Like there was that, you know, I was like, I want my child to speak. I want him to go to college. And, and then they, you know, they brought him in and they were like, touch car. And I, and I always, I always say, I was like, touch car. How are we going to get to college on touch car? I want him to say, I went to school and this happened. And Hey mom, did you know about this and whatever? How are we going to get there? Uh, and touch car, that's not going to do it. But I watched the progression as they did touch car and then said, what is that? It's a car. And then it was, tell me, you know, over a period of time with a bunch of lessons and a bunch of prompting, tell me three things about a car. What else, you know, and then they would say, let's talk about, you know, uh, give me an example of a vehicle. Oh, well, a car is a vehicle, right? And they would add in all these other things, plus give him all this other talk about general knowledge stuff so that he had something to talk about. And then they would painstakingly prompt like a volley of a, a, a tennis ball where they would say, hey, Jem, how are you? And Jem would go, good, right? And they would say, now ask me how I am. <laughs> and, and he would say, how are you? And they would say, good. And he would walk away and they would, come, they would say, come back. What else could you ask me, right? And go through this whole painstaking process. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, it, it will never just happen spontaneously. And then a day came where somebody said, how are you? And he said, I'm good, how are you? What? Like we didn't have to prompt it anymore. And then a day came where they said, you know, how are you, Jim? He said, I'm good. How are you? Hey, you know what? I saw in a magazine that it did this thing that you like. What? And, you know, and I, I remember they would have us count, like how many volleys back and forth could you go until one day we got to seven and then I stopped counting. Yeah. But it didn't magic. Nobody came in and waved a wand. It was work. It was work and they made it fun for him. So if you're just doing speech, 
it's that's not going to happen. They're, they, you're not going to get enough funding for speech to do that. Um, you, you know, help me out here, Evelyn. But it real. This is why you need to do ABA. It's it, and that's why if you hear what I just said, I said communication, not speech, because it's communication that they need to understand first. Because once they realize I say these words and suddenly it appears, that's the beginning of communication with somebody. And so words and speech and language may be a method there, but it's what you want that kid to understand is if I use these words, all these things can come back and not just the things I want. I can find out information. I can get a hold of understanding what's coming or what passed and they, they start to want to talk and it might be initially for their own desires and not a social thing, but at some point it does turn into, hey, you're kind of useful. <laughs> And parents hate that. They're like, I don't want to feel like I'm used. I'm like, but initially, if you, that is what the beginning of communication is. I want something, so I'm going to use it. And then at some point, it's like, it's kind of fun sitting here with you and talking to you. And then it's like, that's the beginning of the social aspect. Like one of the biggest markers for, there's, you know, way in the back when autism was one in 10,000, what was common in all the kids was the minute um, they could walk, they would leave the room. Mm. Bad for the fam families because yeah. they just knew something was not going right. And um, especially if the other kids who were dying to be on their laps and stuff. And then they had the one kid who would walk out of the room and they were like three years old. And so I used to use that as a marker when people are talking. And if the kid came in and just plopped himself down and just looked around, <laughs> whether they had language or not, that mm -hmm. interaction was super meaningful. And yeah. big deal because that kid wanted to be with parents, wanted to be with people. And I always say that is like, I can't really teach it. I can kind of build it up, you know? And then, but at some point when the kids would do that, I would be like, this is a huge milestone. He wants awesome. to hear whether he can talk and interact vocally or not. He's so happy to be there with his parents, with his, his siblings, with, you know, people. And, you know, autism is a social delay, you know, it's a social disorder, you know, it's not functional. So that I always use that as a milestone still when that kid comes and wants to be there. And then we can talk about what they're doing when they're there with you, you know, that's, that's a separate other thing. But there is just like, it slowly builds up. You have to be patient. It's really hard. But if your child is mending, there's a lot of hope there. And that's what you need to cling on to. There's a lot of you know, skill that's going to come and you keep encouraging it and keep reinforcing it. And that is the part of ABA that makes it, I think, really effective. Yeah. And please don't ex expect that to all come from speech. It, it won't. It, it, it just, that's not, that's not what they're trying to accomplish in that half hour, hour, even hour and a half that you're getting a week of uh, speech. If you're interested in getting ABA, want to encourage you um, to look and see who the local ABA providers are. Obviously, I love me some card. They're the ones who gave me um, my child back. And, and of course, Evelyn uh, works for card. Uh, you can go to uh, centerforautism.com to find out if they're anywhere near you. Uh, I also want to say, too, that if they aren't, or if you just want to get some more information about some of the lessons that we're talking about, um, Skills Global and IBT, which is the Institute for Behavioral Training, sends me a weekly thing to let me know what their free options are for you guys. So this week, um, for ABA parents and guardians, it says we will continue our free IBT parent e-learning course parent useful strategies for your home. So if you want to know more things about how to make things work at home, they're offering free video trainings. Um, normally there's a cost associated with these, but they're offering them free this week, parent useful strategies for the home. For the educator community, and you can um, tell your teachers, your child's teachers about this, uh, they're offering their free IBT educator e-learning modules, educator impact on the classroom. And they're offering those to teachers for free at no charge. I'm going to give you a phone number in a minute for your teacher to call. Uh, they are also continuing to offer their registered behavior technician 2.0 training course. That's what beginning therapists um, the course that they learn, it's about a 40 hour online program um, before they go on to get their certification. 
Uh, they're offering that free for parent uh, for our parent audience on a case by case basis. You have to call and ask them for it. Uh, say that your friends and you're in the friends and family program with Shannon. Uh, and then in addition, they are giving a 10% discount on all skills products for anyone that um, says that they saw us here. And the phone number to call, are you ready for this? It's 877-975-4559. Again, that's 877-975-4559. Now, if you, many of you have written to us and said you're out of the country and that's not an easy thing for you to do. So they've also included an email this week, training at ibehavioraltraining.com. That's training at ibehavioraltraining.com. And that is what we hear from the folks at Skills and IBT this week. Uh, with your permission, Evelyn, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Good morning, can ABA provider uh, provide kids an instructional aid or school shadow during online school this year if they are already engaging ABA therapy with CARD? This is like the question of the day. Uh, do they, does the ABA have to sign a contract with the school district or is that through your medical insurance? His teacher said she was going to look into the possibility of an instructional aid. I remember during our intake, the lady told me they might be able to help with an instructional aid and school shadows in the school for academics, but not in the home. What my son is having therapy for. Maybe the school might be able to provide one, but I rather that, uh, but I, I rather than have ABA experience, so I thought I'd ask about how that works. Okay, where do they live? That's the big question. <laughs> yeah, if you can write in and tell us what state you're in um, and even potentially what school district, I will share that with Evelyn. I don't necessarily need to share that with the world, but it really, you know, it it's varies. Sort of Right. Yeah. So in the U.S., if you're in the U.S., it's you have what's called FAPE, free and appropriate education. OK, so every child is guaranteed that. And, you know, that's the beginning of this. If you have health insurance funding, your health insurance funding has medical guidelines, medical necessity guidelines. And that funding is for medical necessity. And that means it must whatever the, the, your uh, card person is working on, they are working, their ABA person has to work on things related to the core symptoms of autism. And it has to be from the medical um, viewpoint. They should not be using that type of funding for anything academic because then that would belong to the school district. And what we try to talk to families is there is some overlap. Let's say if you have problem behaviors, if your child's having a meltdown and tantrums, it's gonna affect school learning and it's gonna affect um, medical necessity guidelines because the safety of your child is in jeopardy. So there are a few things that overlap, but for the most part, you need to work with your ABA person to figure out like, what are the goals that they've set? Because there are school IEP goals and then there are your medical necessity goals. And um, depending on the funding is what you can use um, the therapy for. And some schools have been, you know, we work with some districts where they're like, no, you can, you know, we want your card person there and we fund card and to be there with our child, you know, your child through Zoom or the internet through classes to still prompt and all of that. But the thing is a lot of schools have specifics like, yeah, you can't be in the home because they don't want the liability of having somebody at home. And so they're saying you can help, but you have to do it through Zoom. And in the same way, some insur insurance with medical parity, insurance can't limit where a service is happening if they're giving medical necessity, because if a person is diabetic, you can't say that they can't have their insulin when they're in the school setting. You know, so that's an aspect of um, on the medical side. So you really have to work with your BCBA to see what the goals are for academics and what are the, you know, that the school's given and what they're approving and then what is given on the medical necessity side. That said, we have had some schools come to us and say, you cannot be there, you know, to support school. We don't care. And it's because they're afraid that they're going to sue because at some point you can, if you can say, hey, my child did so well this year because CARD came and supported me and all their academics are way ahead, that means the school didn't give a free and appropriate education because the parents or someone was paying for that. 
And so then there it, be, it becomes a legal issue about did the parent, did the school give what the child needed, and that becomes the big discussion that um, schools, uh, uh, you know, they want to have some control over that through their IEP process and all of that. So if you have a district that does fund for ABA, you know, for paraprofessionals there with you in school and all of that, that's where you need an advocate to kind of walk you through the process. If you are in a CARD office where the, the person at CARD is telling you, yes, we have people in your district, there is another way sometimes, like we have some really good relationships with school districts where we just call them and say, hey, this person came in, they, you know, we're gonna recommend that they need somebody at school, like let's start talking about this. And, you know, we have some of those discussions, but it really does vary according to state and according to district. And, you know, do they have their own ABA in their district, you know, that they're trying to give? And then the coordination and the collaboration involved is really important. But it, it, there is a way to do this. It's just what we say is go to your district. If your district is saying, hey, Zoom is not working, my child cannot learn with the therapist on the other end, you need to try it show that it doesn't work, go to the district and say, hey, this is not working. I need the person in my home. And you know, I need that person with my child there physically to be able to prompt him, to pay attention and this, you know, whatever the need may be. And then that's the discussion that the school needs to have with you about what your child needs in order to have instruction during this very weird COVID time. This very weird COVID time. Now they have written back in and said that they're in Northern California. So I just want to, um, on Mondays, we, you know, obviously we didn't have her this week because it was uh, Labor Day, but on Mondays we have Bonnie Yates with us um, to answer legal questions that have to do with education. She's a uh, educational, um, special education lawyer is what she is. And she's with the Tolner Law Offices and they have offices in Northern California. So they handle cases in Northern California. It doesn't mean that you necessarily need to put a, a lawyer on retainer, but I always say, you know, um, it'll take you at least a half an hour to fill out the paperwork to get the free half hour consultation. It'll be worth your time to sit and say, what are my options right now? And they'll give you a plethora of options and you may decide to retain a lawyer or you may just take the information and, and do exactly what Evelyn said, but, you know, have your ducks all in a row to talk to your school district. Um, but since Bonnie's law or firm is where you are, I would wholeheartedly recommend having a conversation with her about what you're going through. Um, it, it, she talks about it on the show all the time that it's like the wild, wild west right now. School <laughs> districts do not know what to do. No, like no one was prepared for this. They're trying to figure out what to do for the general population, let alone what to do with special education. And in some cases, families are getting the kitchen sink. All they have to do is raise their hand and, and have documentation and say, we're not getting education. Here's what we'd like. And school districts in some cases are giving it to them. In other cases, they're not. It just depends. But I would recommend having a conversation with them. And that's Tolner, T-O-L-L-N-E-R law firm. Uh, if, uh, if you don't mind Googling, I can't think of what the email or the website is right now. We're saying hi to Raja. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, hi, can you share some ideas on how to teach retell? After I read my son a story and ask him to retell, he only gives some nouns or action verbs that involve that are involved in the story and thank you very much. <laughs> There's a lot of skills to retelling. And there is, um, it's not only words, but it's the auditory memory aspect too. And you have to remember that all our kids, they're, learning to speak is almost like learning another, it's learning another language. That's what it is. So like when I go to Hong Kong, my, I spoke up, grew up speaking Cantonese, but when I'm, I have this weird delay People talk to me and then there's this kind of pause and then I can respond. And the longer I'm there, the faster my fluency goes. And people always comment they'll, in, in stores and shops, they'll just be like, where are you from? Because you can speak, but it's just a weird delay that happens. Um, and it's because I, I just am not as fluent as English. And so I always say, tell parents, when you're talking about retelling something, there's a lot of elements in it because some of our kids do have some type of auditory memory processing delay where you have to give them some time to kind of get it all through their system. And if you wait a little bit longer, they're able to retell it. 
But if you ask too soon, it's very difficult. But that's a portion of the population. Not everybody has a delay. But also, the words that he's picking up to tell you may be the only words that he really understands. You know, earlier I talked about concrete versus abstract concepts. And a lot of times our kids know the concrete, no problem. Car is amazingly concrete, right? Because they get in it and they play with it and there's all these things. But getting a little bit more abstract is color because a cup can be blue, but also a car can be blue and my shirt can be blue. And if they don't know what a shirt, a car or a cup is, they're gonna be really confused. <laughs> So, you know, but it's like the first aspect. And once they get color, then we're talking about things that are dependent on variables such as propositions, spatial information. I can say this is behind my computer, but if I move my computer, it might be in front of my computer now, you know? And so just learning that spatial aspect. And I would actually, when you read to your child and he repeats back the words, I actually would write down what those words are. And I would mm. ask him, say like, what words isn't he retelling? Mm -hmm. because it gives you an idea of his understanding of those words he's re probably repeating all the words that he knows for sure they're fluent they're easy to you know bring out of memory you know no problem but I would look at what all those other words are because that probably gives you an idea of how fluent or how much he understands what those words are and then putting it together you know is also an issue but it, retelling and sometimes our kids, like when they get to the point, you know, we work on conversation and retelling is hard, it's hard. And finally, they, they get to the point where they can tell me, I've had a kid tell me, why do you want me to retell this? Because you were here with me. <laughs> and doesn't that make sense? <laughs> yeah. And I always say ABA kids are a little bit confused about questions because we ask them questions that we know the answer to already. So there's a certain point in ABA programming where I work with supervisors and saying, okay, you really need to teach them what the questions are, gain information, and it's not just to repeat what you already know. And going between that aspect to really understanding what a question is for, the kids get so confused, but you've been asking me my name for like a year <laughs> and you know my name. <laughs> uh, right? You know, and then you're, and then that's, you know, and that gets in the whole perspective taking, right? Because, and you're telling them, like, I was asking your name because I want to make sure you knew your name. I didn't know your name. You know, it was just, I needed to make sure that you could respond. And then they're like, oh, okay. And then there's like a host of other questions that come. But initially, you know, ABA does, you know, make the quest understanding of what a question is for a little bit skewed. But once you get them to the point where they understand that they can ask a question that they don't know that they need information on. And a lot of times it's usually has to do with their schedule. <laughs> coming, They want to know what's coming. And, um, if, just by doing that, that is helpful. But recalling information, I mean, I was, I remember being blown away by this kid that's like, why are you always, like all you people are constantly asking me things that you already know. And I was like, oops, okay, I need to, you know, be, be able to go back. So there's different reasons, but initially take down notes on the words that he is repeating back to you. Look at the, you know, the words that he's not repeating and figure out like how fluent they are for him, how easy it is for him to use those words. I love it. Uh, okay, so I, I don't know that this is the first time that this has happened, but uh, somebody's offering you a job. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hi, I'm a BCBA at an agency in California. We provide home services and no school services. Is Evelyn open to be referred to families? Um, <laughs> uh, Evelyn has a job and she's over busy. Uh, I know. I wish we could clone her, right? Wouldn't that be the best? Um, but I, you know, I don't know how you want to respond to that, Evelyn, but I know a lot of the work that you've done over the years exists in skills, mm -hmm. uh, that Evelyn has taken a lot of her knowledge and, and put it into skills. Um, and so, and we already gave you the number for skills. Uh, and <laughs> if you're a BCBA, there's a card, the card model book. Yes, that might be a good book or resource for you to be able to, you know, read and just kind of understand the thinking behind teaching and learning with because in BCBA programs, they teach you a lot about challenge how to handle challenging behaviors, but there still is not a lot of teaching on what development is and how just the skill acquisition portion of learning 
So I encourage the BCBA to spend some time. You know, like I always tell the new BCBAs that come in, you probably haven't had a develop, child development class since like your freshman year of college. It's time to go back and really look at what development is because we, at CARD, we do use that model to a degree. We use development, but then we actually say, okay, here's the symptomology for what autism is, his, these are the symptoms, and then we go accordingly. So even though like a beginning skill for a lot of, um, for babies is like eye contact, you know, joint attention for that first year, that's a really hard skill to teach. So we might mm -hmm. with simple eye contact, but maybe joint attention won't come because the, the act of sharing is such a, a complicated skill we may not work on the sharing aspect till they have some language and have some desire for social interaction. <laughs> so the second part of it may come later, but really that's what a lot of behavior analysts have told us when they come to CARD, they're very surprised at how much development plays. I always say all our kids go through development, but the timing, it might be off. You know, it might come later, it might be a shorter period, but they still go through all, a lot of the aspects of development. Wonderful. Uh, people, there's so much love for you on the chat, uh, saying that you're amazing. And somebody said, amazing. My cousin is severely autistic and he shows me a new vision. We can chill and play with a light bright. And they say, love you, cousin Peter. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. Uh, somebody else wants to know, how do you differentiate ADHD with autism? This is a very good question. Yeah, because up until 2015, you could not diagnose the two together. Because the way that we used to, the, the um, analogy we used to use was, if you go into the doctor's office and you have, you have bronchitis, the doctor's not gonna diagnose a cough also. Because cough is being a part of um, the bronchitis. And so we used to use that element where kids that have ADHD that couldn't pay attention you know, couldn't focus, you know, long enough to actually learn in the way that we would say, we're not going to say your attention deficit is there because we're just going to say the, the higher or more um, complicated diagnosis would be autism. You know, that's what it is. In 2015, there was a realization in that DSM that you could have both. And they're very rare that where they're, where it's like, I see kids, like I've seen kids over the years and I know the kids that had, you know, even back when they said you couldn't diagnose this way, I was like, no, this kid is seriously ADHD. <laughs> like, and autism, there's two components. Um, because a lot of times ADHD, there's really specific criteria that you have to meet for ADHD. And it's attention, not only attention deficit, but it's, you know, the hyperactivity or without hyperactivity. But there's also like, there's some interesting ways of diagnosing, like a lot of ADHD can, can pay attention to video screens, but they can't pay attention to anything else. But video screens is for some, whatever reason is an exception. And, um, and with autism, there it, both attention, all of the attention is your pre which is your executive function skills. So with autism, there are a lot of executive function um, dysfunction issues too where you can't pay attention or your memory is delayed or there's some kind of processing or you don't understand what's important. You know, people used to always ask these things. And I used to always say like, if you're looking at an eight, I, what I used to do was it was my own mini assessment and there's no research behind this at all. But if I had an ADHD kid come in, all I did was have to ask them like about friends and things. They totally understood what that was. But if I asked a kid with autism about friends, it was, you could tell either it was rote or they didn't really understand what friendships were. And that was for me was like an kind of like the easy, like unscientific researched way of knowing like, okay, there is a lot of, there's a lot of autism in this when you had to choose one or the other. Now that the ability for both, but like there's um, with the onset of ABA being effective for autism, uh, there are funding sources now that are starting to understand that ABA helps people with ADHD too. And like, I've actually had quite a few ADHD, peer only ADHD patients. And usually they were the siblings of my, my um, ASD kids. And it was really interesting for me because um, 
it was like trying to get them to focus. They understood why they had to focus, but getting them to do it was very difficult. And a lot of ADHD kids actually do have social issues. It's not the understanding of the social issue. It's like when they can't pay attention long enough to have a conversation or to share some kind of enjoyment with somebody, it's hard to develop friends because people feel, you know, that, you know, because you can't pay attention to me, I'm going to go do something else, you know, with someone else. And so there are actually a lot of social issues that come into play with ADHD kids also. It's just that the basic understanding of what being social is, is all there. It's just putting it into action is very difficult you know, because they're not attending long enough. And I, just because I can't not, I just want to say to people, if you are seeing um, your child and you're wondering ADHD or you're seeing a lack of focus, I just want to encourage you to start looking at the studies that the first one that came out in 2011, showing that um, the amount of pesticides in your child's system is directly uh, related to those, that lack of attention and um, an inability to focus. Um, and, and then you will be like the rest of us and start to, I, there's no way to have no pesticide in a person's diet at this point, but to try to get it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as low as possible. And then you will find yourself wanting to know what the, the dirty dozen are, which are the, the 12 things that you this year, and it changes every year, the 12 things that you will not eat unless they're organic because they're covered in pet pesticide and the clean 15, which gets longer every year. They add things to it, things that you can totally buy conventional. You don't have to buy them organic because the minimal pesticides, if any, are used even when they grow it conventionally. But getting your child, uh, you know, as clean of pesticides as possible is, is something that I definitely think people should at least look at. Look at the studies because I poo-pooed it. I poo-pooed it. I was like, I just, I just don't think that that's a thing. Uh, and then when I did the research, I, it was like, uh, whoo, I, I won't go into the whole thing right now, but, um, you know, when you understand that pesticides are a neuro disruptor, I thought pesticide, it means it kills the bugs. It isn't. They're neuro disruptors. And what they do is they disrupt the, the bugs ability for its brain to talk to its arms and legs. And what it does is it, 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 given a certain amount of pesticide, it makes the bugs, legs and arms move a lot so that they're too busy to concentrate to eat and they die of starvation. That's what pesticides um, do to bugs. And if they give more, what happens is they move so much that it locks up and then they can't move their arms and legs and they die of starvation. And when you know that and you go, we are allowing this to get put into our children's diets and we are shocked that so many kids have ADHD and that they can measure the amount of pesticide in their urine and it correlates to them de demonstrating more behaviors. You go, oh, I think I'm gonna lower the pesticide in my child's diet. Start looking 2011, that's when the first study came out. Uh, also people are saying, uh, two people just ordered the book. They were like, I didn't know there was a book. Apparently I have not talked about the book. Um, um, can, I, can I say one thing about the ADHD? ASD? Yes. If you have a child and you're trying to figure out if they're ADHD or ASD, I'd encourage you to just go and get an evaluation. Don't, you know, a lot, we do have a lot of families who it's easier to take the diagnosis of ADHD than it is to take the diagnosis of ASD, but early intervention is the key. So the earlier you find out if there is something more severe going on, the better your child will be due in intervention and with every development. We have too many families who they think ADHD and then they get to school age where it becomes an issue in school. And, then, and they might think that there might be something else going on, but they don't get an evaluation. They just kind of just like hope it's ADHD. And they come in like at seven or eight and it, then it's like a full disruption on school. And, you know, I would, even though we can still help at that older age, we can do a lot more if they come in younger and early intervention really is effective. And I know it's so hard for a family to get that kind of diagnosis, but if you have any qualms on one or the other, just go and try to get an evaluation and find out what it really is and then decide what you're going to do about it. Okay, 
Um, somebody wants to know what foods have pesticides. Uh, almost everything has some level, right? Uh, anymore yeah. in our world, but um, depending on you know where they're certified organic, you should be looking at significantly less pesticides. But as I said, there's a dirty dozen and a clean 15 list. The first thing I would do is get your you can Google it, dirty dozen. And, and it will tell you what the 12 foods are this year that the most pesticides are used on. And it changes a little bit every year, but a good rule of thumb is if it's something where you eat the skin of the fruit or vegetable, it's more likely to have pesticide on it. If it's something where you're having to peel it and then eat it, less pesticide, right? Um, and every, every year it depends on like what's happening in the crops. There might be one year when, um, you know, there's like a particular pesticide that's eating through things. And so they, uh, they, they use more pesticides. So it does change every year. And then you can look at the clean 15 and there are things that you don't have to buy organic. Um, it's perfectly safe to eat them otherwise. Uh, okay, somebody, well, this is probably the last question. And then I have a comment towards the end. Um, but somebody wants to know how fast uh, does a 2.4 year old boy recover um, who's currently saying his first word? Hey, you know what? I can't guarantee the progress of any child, but if he actually vocalizing his first words and he's two and a half, it can happen. The fastest I think has happened for me is like by preschool, you know, like we're at the end of preschool, we're done. We, we actually, um, do transition into kindergarten to make sure things are in place and then we're gone. We have a lot of those kids that do the two to five, two to six year old in and out. Um, that's full 40 hours and intensely working on it. And then 40 hours a week, 40 hours, a week, 40 hours yes. of quality <laughs> ABA a week done by therapists and then family doing more after that. I just want to be clear. Yes. And full collaboration with schools you know, working with the school, allowing aides in, allowing, you know, just the whole discussion. And so we've had, I've had many kids, I've had my first doctor recovery kid started at two, like two, one or two months, and she finished, we rolled her right into kindergarten, made sure she was okay, and then we were gone. And to this day, she has no idea, and she actually is in this field and has no clue. <laughs> um, and the parents have just cho chosen. And when she was around seven or eight, because I would go in at holidays and just say hi. She was like, why don't you come play with me anymore? <laughs> and I was like, own friends. <laughs> you don't need it. And she was like, oh, okay. And that's all it was. Um, and then we have other kids who come in at two and maybe their things get complicated and then they leave around seven or eight, you know, if you're on the recovery end. Um, we had a kid who was completely nonverbal and we actually had to use text, which is using icons to talk and everything and then at some point you know kicked and he was probably five or six at that point but once his visual memory kicked in in school he learned how to read and the structure of it was helpful um then you know we stayed with him till he was 10 you know just it everybody has their own path and that's what I would encourage you the most is you know just you it can be done pretty quickly I wouldn't rush it but I would say like put in the hours, the intensity of good quality ABA plus all the caregiver follow through that happens and you might have a good outcome. And you, it might not be within what you wanted, but it might, it could be too. We don't know, but put it in. There's a lot of great outcomes. There we go. I, I, I wanna thank you so much. I'm gonna leave with one because we've had two questions in the last you know, today and last night come in. Apparently on the doctors, they reran an episode recently that uh, featured uh, MERT. And so we've had people writing in and asking for opinions. And I, I just want to say, um, I don't I don't have an opinion uh, yet, um, but I would, I really want to encourage people to go read what uh, John Elder Robeson has written about going through it as an adult. Um, for those of you who don't know MERT, it's, uh, I just want to get it right, it's magnetic e-resonance therapy, um, where they, they use very high-powered magnets on the brain. We've had adults on the spectrum writing in and saying they're very concerned about how much this is being talked about. I do want to caution everyone that uh, the, the two people that I know that have done it, both of them have had some pretty, in, in, 
negative impactful things happen. Uh, I, they can speak to the fact that they, you know, whether it was worth it for them or not, but that there were some negative things. And so I, I really want to caution parents that you not do this with your child unless you have done, you know, a lot more research than what I know about. Um, so I, I just want to put that out there. Um, but if you if you're curious about it, look up John Elder Robeson. He's a very famous author, individual on the autism spectrum, and he wrote very eloquently about why he chose to do it and what it was like um, for him. Um, I would start there. Anyway, uh, Evelyn, I thank you so much for being here with us always. Um, somebody just wrote in, does skills help parents teach their kids? It gives you the curriculum of what to teach your kids. It's pretty brilliant. And, and Ev, I, you know, it, there, a substantial portion of your life's work has been poured into it. Uh, what Ev knows, it's like they tried to crack her head open and go, Ev, can you pour that in here to this program? Am I wrong? <laughs> Some version of that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, so check, check that out, skillsforautism.com. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for being with us and answering our questions. We appreciate you. I know you have things you have to go to. So much love to you. And please make sure you convey our happy birthdays. Thank you. All right. Thank <laughs> you. And uh, guys, we're back tomorrow. And tomorrow, uh, I'll try to have the clean, uh, the dirty dozen and the clean 15 for you. But we're also having David Zimmerman on the show tomorrow. He is from a wonderful show called Meet the Biz and has been... Uh, instrumental in a wonderful movie called Honey Bunny that we're going to talk about. And he is working on inclusion in the entertainment industry in a way that I don't think anybody else is. So we're going to talk with him tomorrow and that's going to be super duper fun. He knows lots of the famous people uh, and interviews them a lot. So, uh, <laughs> which is a very fun thing. He just did, he just did interview Julie Newmar, who I, most of you are too uh, young to know, but Julie Newmar was Catwoman on the Batman show. And, and like, it was so exciting to see him interview Julie Newmar. Um, so anyway, we'll catch up. And yesterday he just interviewed Kobe Bird from Lock and Key, who we love here on the show. So we'll talk with him about that tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Thanks for watching Autism Live. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.